to start our uh, talk, I wouldn't call that discussion. We will talk a little about collecting art, about collecting contemporary art. But uh, before the talk, I will introduce myself. Then artterritory.com will introduce themselves. Uh, afterwards, I will introduce our three wise men who, who are sitting in front of you. Uh, so my name is Tadas. Uh, I think that those Lithuanians should have heard me from National Channel. I work in the culture show. I am a voiceover of National Channel. Uh, so basically that's it about me. And if we now might have some attention for Agnese, who is uh, an English editor of artterritory.com. You may applause if you, if you like. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yes, um, my name is Agnes, and I'm the English editor of the artterritory.com. It's a culture and art website, and I will kindly ask for your attention for some minutes. I would love to introduce you with the project uh, in which we are involved for some years already. And uh, the name of the project is Our Territory Conversations with the Collectors. This is a magazine, and you can find this magazine in this corner in three different uh, colors. And there's my water, thank you. Could you please show me how to, how can I move to the next slide? Actually, there are four colors, not three colors. Um, four years ago, we started the Art Territory Conversations with the uh, Collectors Project with the aim to introduce the public with the most important and prestige art collections. We started with Europe, and then we uh, moved forward, and now, already in our four editions, you can read conversations with the collectors from Japan to US. Um, actually, our very, very personal motivation was to demonstrate that art and collecting can become a meaningful part of everyone's life, uh, just like it is with us. And um, we have this kind of inside joke that uh, collectors are collecting art, but we are collecting collectors or conversations with the collectors to be included in these magazines. Um, the very first issue of the magazine came out in um, 2014, and uh, since then there have been published 47 interviews with the world, world leading uh, art collectors. And yes, in total, there are 47 interviews, and we have spent more than 100 hours in these conversations with these very, very passionate individuals. Uh, the last two editions we launched in the Venice Biennale during the professional, uh, professional preview days. Here you can see uh, some kind of party. <laughs> And uh, this ga gathering turned out as a possibility for the collectors included in the magazine to meet each other. To, to meet each other. And uh, next week, or after two weeks, we are going to present our latest edition also in uh, Vienna, uh, during the Vienna Contemporary Art Fair. Uh, the presentation will take the form of a public talk. Uh, it will be a public talk with the uh, Lithuanian art collector Vilius Kavirauskas. Uh, and last year we did the same with uh, our great Estonian art collector Ivo Anton. Do you remember that experience? I do. Yes, <laughs> great. <laughs> and, uh, and now I would like to highlight a fact uh, that the magazine provides 
not only a look into extraordinary art collections, but also a very down-to-earth exchanges on how art and collecting has changed the lives of each specific individual. Uh, for somebody, collecting can become an adventure that can make them feel just as, just as exciting as uh, going on a solo trip to the South Pole or uh, exploring the underground tunnels and labyrinths on the New York City utility system. That's how this urge of collecting was described by Norwegian art collector and extreme adventurer, uh, adventurer Erwin Kage. We can see him in this slide. And uh, yeah, this is Erwin, and uh, this is an art piece of his collection. And the interview with uh, him you can read in our third edition of magazine. Um, New York-based art collector Daniel Wolf collects because he feels that he can learn from art. And as he says, owning is not the goal, learning is. You can see Daniel Wolf in the picture, and this is our book. And then we have other kind of stories. For example, for Belgian art collector Galila Barzilai Olander, Collecting helped to compensate the loneliness of the, the death of, his, of her husband. And uh, still, uh, she is commissioning artworks uh, which are very strongly related to herself, to her life, and to existence. A uh, conversation with uh, Galila you can read uh, in our latest, the blue edition. And, uh, what I would like to add about the latest four edition is that it illustrates examples on how private collectors have handed their collections over to the public. And it talks a lot about the responsibilities of the collector. For example, 95% uh, of the artists in Galila's collection are young and emerging. And uh, she is certain that the responsibility of the collector is to promote the artist in all possible ways, such as lending their works to the exhibitions, I mean, uh, museum exhibitions. Uh, she even has proposed her artist to the museum by herself. And if an artist wasn't selected, she obtained that uh, the image of the artist's work was used for the uh, front cover of the catalog of the exhibition and on the poster. Uh, in her point of view, another part of collector's contribution is to help make connections, to make, uh, to, to make connections with the galleries. As she says, a suggestion or recommendation from a collector can open a lot of doors for the artist. And by the way, next year she is opening a space for her collection in Brussels. So it will be also available to the public. And then we have American art collector Robert Rubin. Among other things, he is collecting an architecture. That means uh, he has to care about it and he has to maintain, man, maintain these uh, masterpieces of art architecture. And usually he is associated with the three icons of modernist architecture. You can see in the picture, uh, this is a tropical house uh, for France colonies in Africa. He has restored it. And uh, 10 years ago, uh, he donated this uh, masterpiece to Center Pompidou. Um, the, the, and the, I'm sorry. The other icon is Blaise Aragon. And this is a prototype for low-cost portable housing of the future. Ruby restored it, he exhibited it, and he planned to make this futuristic construction as an object of inspiration and studies for the students of uh, architecture and design. And then there's a third one, Maison de Verre. He lives in it. 
collector lives in this house. He's, he collected him, he bought him, he collected him, and he lives uh, in it. Actually, he is trying to understand and to learn how to live in this kind of uh, living machine because uh, it lacks some kind of amenities and it requires uh, ongoing uh, restoration. And other thing he is collecting is a valuable archive of cinema, scripts, uh, uh, set drawings, etc. And this does not mean that he is always very interested in these things, uh, but he is interested for these things to stay together as one. And as he has said, he is trying to go down the black holes because he understands that if he won't do this, nobody else will. Uh, yeah, I, I, I talk about the responsibilities of the artists, uh, of the collectors, and then we have another story uh, related to uh, well-known French sculptor and uh, collector Bernard Benet. We can see him in a picture. And this is a work of him. This is not a work of him. But the story is that the, the majority of, the, of today's art legends were Benet friends, uh, starting from Saul Levy to Donald Judd. And um, at that time, they all exchanged artworks with uh, one another. And over the years, Benet gathered uh, one of the strongest and also most personal art collections in the world. Here you can see uh, the example of Saul Levy. And, um, and then he established the foundation, the Benet Foundation, in France. Place for his own works and as well uh, place for uh, uh, his collection. And after the death of the artist, uh, the property that now belongs to his family uh, will pass to the foundation, to the society. And when asked why does he do that, he answers, I became an artist, which was my dream. I love art, and I'm surrounded by the greatest works of art. This society gave me the chance to do this, and I think I owe it to society to give back this art. So everything is going back to society. I hope I, hope I made some kind of connection on what will be discussed uh, in discussion. I hope the uh, collectors will share their experiences and try, they will try to, to, to tell how they are uh, trying to support artists. And yes, thank you. If you are interested in other uh, magazines, um, we are more than willing and open to tell you. Uh, please, I, I can introduce you, with, uh, I can explain you everything and my, as well as my colleague and I will be here. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, thank you, Agnes, for the presentation of artterritory.com. Uh, I don't know if you can feel how our uh, presenters are willing to express their feelings about art, but I can feel that they want to speak about it. But still, I will speak now shortly about you. Uh, we, every one of you, I think, knows who, who are sitting in front of you. But still, shortly. Mr. Rolandas Valunas, lawyer, uh, Alex Valunas and partner law firm for 25 years, the biggest law firm, the collector, the patron, uh, the collection, if I'm not wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, for 6,000 pieces, more or less, 1,000 <laughs> Okay, you're very talkative, no. more or less. <laughs> uh, yes, Yanni Zuzans, uh, entrepreneur from uh, entertainment business, uh, collector, patron, uh, Purvitis Prize Lat in Latvia, 28,000 euros pre-tax, the Purvitis Prize. Uh, I found that number in online. Mm -hmm. uh, our territory, it's your, your idea and you support it, yes? Correct me if I'm wrong. 
No, it's wrong. It's the idea from Daiga Rozak. Yeah, the idea, but uh, the money is yours. You can say. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, journal in law. Journal in law, yes. Uh, Riva Anton, Estonia, entrepreneur. What, what is your business? You? Nowadays it's mainly tech investments. Tech investments, yes. You call yourself, yourself uh, not a collector, but somehow differently. Uh, friend of art? Friend of art, yes. Later on we'll talk about it, why you call it so. And uh, let's start from the first and the very basic question. As far as I know, if you are a vegetarian, uh, everyone asks you the why. Very, very common question. I don't know if that question is very common for you, if you are a collector or art patron. So, Mr. Rolandas Volunas, if I ask you, why do you, do you collect? I think this is the beginning for the whole, uh, so to say, uh, not industry, but for the whole art market. That question, why do you collect and why do you support? So, so yes. just be careful because that answer can take one hour or more if you will not be stopping time. Yeah, I, ha I have the time. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I will interrupt you. If good. You are just boring. in polite, in polite way. Please. In polite manner. Okay. Uh, well, I started, I guess, in year, well, except my use uh, things like postmarks or whatever, if we forget that. So I really started collecting probably in year 2000, when uh, I decided that my empty walls uh, need something. So it was still not collecting, that so was uh, getting something interesting for the walls. And I was lucky in the way that my friend brought me to the brightest and the largest collector at that time, uh, Adam Dosarmoshka, uh, who was a really, really bright man uh, with only a bit poor character. Uh, and when I was brought to him, he actually he put on the, on the ground the nice collection of Antanas Muzinavichos, Jonas Matskevichos, and, and uh, Czeslav Janusz. And he said, okay, you collect one painter, you take old paintings. It was like, you know, 12 Muzinavichos, uh, 15 Matskevichos, and 13 uh, Czeslav Janusz. You can take painter all. You cannot take one Muzinavichos, one Janusz, or whatever. So I looked for two hours at the paintings. And at that time, as many people in this room probably, I knew only the one name, Antanas Mizanovich. Everyone knew that name uh, in the Soviet time. Uh, the rest names, well, you know, maybe you heard something, but you really didn't know. But the funny enough, what I did, I left Mizanovich behind me, which I'm now, today I'm sorry about what I did, uh, and I took two others which immediately brought me like 25 or 27 paintings on my walls. Uh, the reason why I didn't take Zmizinavichus was uh, because Zmizinavichus was all post-war period, which means a bit gray, a bad mood, uh, and if you look at Jonas Mascavichus, all the paintings from, from Italy or from Morocco, you know, nice, sunny, colorful, um, Czeslav Janos, who became a bit sweet after the war, but his pre-war paintings were really nice, and, and probably only one Lithuanian who painted the sea at that time constantly. So, you know, when I put everything on the walls, uh, after one month, I realized I want more. And in my view, it is the, when you become collector, or art friend, or whatever name you put it, uh, when you still buy when your walls are full of art. Then you are becoming collector because you know you are not just buying to see each day, you are buying for various reasons which make you collector. And another my uh, big move was probably one day when I saw the nice old Lucene Maps collection at in one of the uh, shops uh, in Vilnius. You know, I always loved history. And uh, as you know, the collecting teaches you a lot. And what I really hate in Lithuania is that Lithuanians know that the history until Vito does the great died. 
because you know Jalgiris battle, you know that was probably some of them know that 1430 Vitotas died. But if you would ask who was the next Grand Duke of Lithuania after Vitotas, I would not dare to ask in the room, but if you would ask, usually it would be one of 100 people, usually a historian, who would answer that question. But if you would ask who was the second after Svidrigaila, it will be less than one of the 100. And then the history of Lithuanian start uh, in 1918. Somebody heard about the uprisings or that Lithuanian language was prohibited. But you now, for many of us, the history doesn't exist. And that, in my view, is shame. Uh, some people will ask why I should know, who cares? But for me, without the past, there is no future. And when I saw the maps, you know, I really wanted to know more about them. I wanted to go deeper and deeper, and I got sick uh, by collecting. And then the things get lost off my hands. I started to buy more, more, more than engravings. For seven years, I, resi I resisted buying the old books. There were nice books that brought on my table, and I said, no, I'm not collecting the old books. Well, I mean, old Lithuanistic books, which in, in, either in Lithuanian language or, or related to Lithuania. And one day, I couldn't, uh, couldn't re resist anymore, and I started the old books. It was the period when I lost a lot of opportunities. I had to pay twice or triple at that time already for the books that otherwise you could, uh, could buy before much more cheaper. You know, and, and that became sickness. So don't ask the sick man why he is sick, because sickness, <laughs> something, you know, that comes to you, crawls to you, and takes you. And then the only question whether you can heal yourself. Yeah, what? what and here I will stop. You do not want to heal yourself as far uh, as I didn't tell that. Okay. Uh, that's next story. What about contemporary art collecting? Uh, I always was a little bit more afraid because being a lawyer, I'm more careful by my professional nature. Yeah? And uh, it's very easy to buy what is historically tested. Much more difficult, you, could be, you, you should be um, uh, mentally sick uh, when, you buy, when you buy contemporary art. Uh, and, you know, well, I, I have quite a lot of contemporary art. Uh, uh, a little bit more easy for me is that some of this art is already tested, like Mindaugas Navakas of Vladis Urbanovicius is a completely tested artist, you know. So it's not, you don't need to be brave to buy them. Or Patricia Yorkshire or many of us. But I'm a bit more afraid when we go to the young artist. Yes, I buy them, but here the problem which I view, all my collection is Lithuanistic. Lithuanistic in the way that I don't care whether it's Lithuanian who painted or did something, it should be related to Lithuania. So Isaac Levitan, for me, Lithuanistic, because he was born and lived here for 15 years. Chaim Sutin went to Vilnius Art School, he is Lithuanistic. Uh, Jacques Lipschitz, very much Lithuanistic, I would call him Lithuanian. So that is easy. Now, when you come to contemporary art, the problem is that to stay this Lithuanistic art, for me, it's already a problem, because that would be a mistake to full my respect to Lithuanian artists, but contemporary art requires much broader view. Here's a big problem. Then you get loose even more, and you can go anywhere around the world, and then you just don't go to region. It wouldn't make sense for me to go to Latvia and Estonia, because contemporary arts in gold, South Africa go anywhere else. And then you don't have the control on yourself at all, and that's the problem. Yes, I bought one nice piece, uh, and that's fault of Varte Gallery. You know, they, they seduce people in very um, intelligent way. They brought me to Irvin Worm House. You, I know, if you know Irvin Worm is probably today is the most popular Austrian artist. And you know, after watching what I saw there, I couldn't stand. Yes, and I bought. So that was my first really non lithuanistic piece, which means I will go forward, question how quickly or how slow I will do. I'll try to do it as slow as possible. Okay. Contemporary art is too cosmopolitan for you. No, I, well, I didn't say that. I'm saying that with, with older lithuanistic art, it's okay for me to concentrate on lithuanistic. 
But if I go contemporary, I would like to see broader world. I do not want just to stay in Vilnius, Kaunas, or wherever else. Then I need to look in Latvia, I need to Estonia, and South Africa, or wherever else. Thank you for your answer. Before the talk, we, Mr. Rolando Spoluna said that he will sleep, and, and I'm grateful for... Now when I'm over, I can sleep. When you are over? Okay. No, I'll end then. No. no, no, we will have more questions. But still, we, we will have uh, some uh, uh, pictures from your collections uh, while we talk. It's not necessary to look at them because you, you, you know these collections. Uh, I have the same questions for uh, Mr. Uh, Yanis Zuzans. Why? I know that I've read online that your father was a collector, correct me if I am wrong. Was that the inspiration or what? What was the reason, maybe, that wasn't the reason, that, that the, your father was a collector? Yeah, my father was a collector, but uh, that didn't uh, give any influence uh, for our art now and our collection, because my father uh, preferred only old masters, Latvian. But our collections, a collection is uh, like a wall, uh, more than 100 years of Latvian art. And uh, our target is to make a uh, wall picture with Latvian art, how we will see. And uh, we, I became a collector, I mm, think, since I remember me, I, I collect uh, every every time some something, some post stamps, then uh, drawings, then posters. Now I became to art and start to collect, <laughs> and and I, I enjoy this process. I enjoy this uh, possibility uh, meeting with artists, acquire their works, and that is the time how I spend it and enjoy. It's easy. It's easy. You only enjoying, that's it. And uh, what about contemporary art? You, you do the contemporary yes, art? Yes, yes. I bought a few artworks yesterday as well. Okay. I didn't buy anything for six weeks. For six weeks. <laughs> Depend from you. <laughs> I'm lucky, finally I'm lucky. Six, week, six weeks period it was no contemporary. Yeah, but no, not you, at all, not but, nothing. But then you come and buy 20 for one. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to be on diet for longer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Mr. Rivanton, what, when did you buy the contemporary art then? Actually, today. <laughs> today? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, today you bought the contemporary art. Yes. Uh, well, I, I do it because I like it. I mean, there's no... Uh, Maybe liking something can be really deep, or it can be also very shallow, but uh, I do it because I like it. Uh, and what I like about it, I think, is the creativ uh, creativity. Because uh, I think many of you might know that most of the jobs available today will disappear at some point, because the machinery will take over. But uh, there are even those lists that, you know, there are a couple of uh, like occupations or professions which will be not taken over by um, uh, by the computers and uh, for example dentist is one but the artist is the other so I think um, I'm, I'm fascinated about the creativity in, 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 in this uh, world and how I actually started uh, buying art or, or looking into it I it was a really a random affair. Uh, I was Googling Estonia on eBay, and I came about a $10 print by some um, like um, old Estonian uh, foreign artist. And I, was, I had no idea like what's about and, and stuff, but I bought it. So it was like $10, and I, I, um, I received it, and I showed it to one of my friends who was working in the museum. And he told, yeah, it's, it's actually original. And I wrote back to this guy and asked, uh, how did you get it? And he said, when the artist passed away, I bought his old collection. 
So I said, could I buy the collection? It was like 80 pieces, I think. And he said, yeah, yeah, do it. So my first acquisition was actually one plus 80. <laughs> so uh, I, I ended up with, with 80 pieces of prints and, and then I guess I was sick as well. Sick to, to a free sick man. Yeah. In a good man. And how, how do you collect? How do you choose what to collect? How do you choose, I want, I will buy this contemporary art, for example, yesterday, you made a choice, yes? What, maybe some galleries or galleries or how, how what's the process? Or just you go, go and I want this, whatever. Well, it, it has been a progress, really. Uh, first, I, I started focusing on uh, Estonian print uh, from the Soviet time, so from, let's say, 60s to, to late 70s. Uh, because at the time, there were uh, uh, annual catalogues of the Estonian prints uh, printed. And those were always in uh, three or four languages, Estonian, Russian, English, and sometimes also Finnish. And once I saw those catalogues, I understood that these were probably one of the few uh, windows out of Soviet Estonia elsewhere, because they were in multiple languages and probably used as some sort of like corporate gifts. So I started collecting all the works that have been published in those catalogues. But later, when I turned more into contemporary, for me, uh, the relationship with the artist is, I think, the most important thing. So, uh, contemporary, I think, is about the narrative, and you can have more of the narrative once you, you, you know the artist, really. I saw in the, in the slide, uh, Mr. Rolandas Bolunas, you have uh, artwork by Sylvanas Kempenas, isn't it? <coughs> Can you tell us the story how Verti Gallery pushed Gilvanas Kempenas to your side? Or was or, or, or I am wrong because it was a guess. Uh, well maybe it's confidential, maybe I cannot tell that uh, about Verti Gallery, I don't know. I, you know. I need to consider it. Oh uh, you know, it was many years ago, so I'm trying to remember, but uh, well Kempenas is one of the really nice let me step back. I mean, with contemporary art, there is contemporary art that you look at it and you love it immediately. And there is contemporary art because it's contemporary art. I mean, well, this table, if it's uh, put here by Campinas, would be contemporary uh, art table, but you might not like it. Yeah? And could be quite expensive, uh, starting 50,000 or more. Uh, well, actually, in this room, there is a person sitting that has the, the probably the best possible collection of contemporary art, um, of international contemporary art, but also Lucianian contemporary art. Uh, and part of this collection uh, is in Vilnius, even. Uh, I always, my dream is that this person would. Uh, would uh, look, would show this collection to the broad audience, and then we would have really possibility to see the best possible contemporary art. And I'm mentioning this person because when you go to this person's apartment, I mean, you see each item that you love immediately. Then you don't need an advisor. You don't need the expert. And there is contemporary art that I'm afraid to buy without the expert, without the monotonicus, whatever it's in English. Uh, because I said, professional lawyer should be a bit careful, you know. So if you, you need to professionally think, okay, I buy today, but what if I need to sell one day? I never, well, it should be clear here. I'm not collecting with the sort I will sell, because investing in art today is still a pretty risky thing. You better invest somewhere else. Don't buy the art if you, you, you think about where to put your money in investment sense. So, Campinas, coming back to Campinas uh, work you saw, on the, I mean, it's one of the pieces you see and like it immediately. And, you know, then is the question only, 
is it nice to negotiate with the artist or not? Uh, when you answer that question to yourself, you just, um, of course, either you negotiate or you just buy it. Uh, so that's easy thing. Okay, thank you. And Jan Susan, how do you choose your pieces of art, or how do you choose which uh, artist to patron? To patron, it's much more easier uh, if I like this uh, guy like a person and I like his art, then I try to support them. But uh, if I want to buy, uh, usually I must, I need to feel some emotional uh, relationship with this art piece, and this is uh, not so. Uh, hard <coughs> way how to recognize because if you every day saw uh, art pieces you lose them thousands and thousands not every day but by your uh, weeks and months yeah. then you immediately understand what happens and what is new something uh, and uh, why and then I this choice is very easy. I want it and I bought it. But I'm thinking if, if you if you see the for example piece of, piece of art, mm -hmm. yes, and it grabs you, yeah. but still you ask for an expert for for an expertise. So why why do you ask for some help? Because well, if I like, I buy. And if well, I, like, I, I never ask experts questions. Thank you. Very short and very wise answer. I mean, that that was very clear. Uh, if it's short, it's definitely yes. Whether it's wise, you can argue. You are arguing about the wise. You are. No, no. I'm, I mean, I mean. Well, could be that Yanis really can trust his judgment. I'm. I'm not trusting my judgment oh. time to time. Uh, uh, so. I. I sometimes I really need an expert. Well, to confirm, well, I never would buy if I like <coughs> expert says it's bullshit, or, or expert would like but I don't like. I would not buy, of course. It's always easy to buy when you like it, and expert says, well, this is really good. Mm. But time to time, I really need an expert. I don't trust myself. Yeah, but the difference is that uh, for me, I never buy art <coughs> like a piece of investment. I buy it because I like this art. And I don't uh, take care. I later maybe sell it's lesser or worse. No, it, for me it's not important. So if we start our talk about the risk management, so that's not a uh, good talk. Because you do not invest, all three of you. And there is no risk in what you are doing. But still, I, I'm thinking if I spend money buying a piece of art, I want to uh, to feel comfortable that I can sell it at least at the same amount of money, isn't it? How, how what are your... Well, um, I think you don't need that comfortable feeling that you can sell it at the same price. Um, if it's your collection, you are doing the choice and that's it. But I've actually researched on the financial returns of uh, of art, and uh, I can definitely assure that there is actually a uh, financial return if somebody desires to have. But uh, yeah, I guess investment-wise, the best uh, return you can have is is actually the emotional interest, which you will rarely see in other investments. I mean, you can look at your stock or some like real estate, but. Um, it's uh, no emotions, but if you look at the art, you can you, you can somehow consume it emotionally. I have a little bit different approach to that issue. You know, I have 1,000 paintings, if you speak about just paintings. And among 1,000 paintings, I made um, from today perspective, you know, because something you saw 15 years ago and today, it could be very different matters. And what you think today, after 10 years, could be again very different. How you view your collection, how you view something you bought. So, when I look back, I made uh, probably five to seven 
stupid mistakes because I bought something that is, from today, my perspective is worthless. And I bought probably 15 or 20 other pieces that, I said, why did I buy it? I don't know. But it's, it's okay, you know, it could be. So I made not so many mistakes, which make me feel happy in the way. But when I buy, it's not like you start to calculate whether you can sell for the same price, but you have automatic feeling in yourself, some safety feeling, you know. Now, you don't know, I mean, maybe you need to sell one day. You don't know how your life will tell you. So I would like to be psychologically sure the pieces of the value that if I need, I can sell it. The last thing that I would do, I would sell it. The best thing that I would not need to sell anything at all. But psychologically, I have something here when I look at the piece of art. So maybe it's a bit different approach from what you do. Well, I but think if you have, so. but if you have a conto and bank, and why you think that you will have the bad time to sell some art piece? Um, because I'm a lawyer, so, you know, I saw different <laughs> stories in the life. I saw very rich people, you know, and I saw them poor. I, I can tell you a story. Like, one of the first contemporary uh, art collectors in Estonia went bankrupt, actually, like, uh, ten years ago. Uh, and I bought uh, a number of pieces from his collection, which was, like, uh, uh, what is it called, like, bankruptcy uh, assets. And, uh, Cheaper and, ones. Uh, don't know, maybe. Uh, and, uh, and I display some of them in my office and I always tell uh, people the story that if you are in entrepreneurship, your companies can actually have negative value at some point. But art will always have some value, whether it's more or less than you paid for it, but it has some value at least. For, for example, for this guy, the alt collection was almost the only asset that he had left in, uh, after bankrupting all the companies. So uh, I think that uh, if you choose uh, wisely, the art will always have uh, some monetary value, but of course you never know whether it's the same uh, as, as it was when you bought it. I would say yes and no, because if you just in your national art, like I'm mainly Lithuanistic art, mm -hmm. just imagine, if I, if I would sell tomorrow my 10 best pieces, I would have the fight with the blood of the people that would like to buy them. And probably the same would happen if I would sell 50 pieces. But what would happen if I would sell 500 pieces? Just imagine, mm -hmm. market would collapse, well, firstly, the people, well, uh, do we have wood here? No, it's not, it's not wood. It's, it's uh, kind of wood, so it's okay. <laughs> Fake. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so maybe. You know, if uh, God say if you would go bankrupt, it's okay. No, it's not okay, but it's okay. But if I would sell today something, yeah, like 30 pieces, everyone would think, no, that's something wrong. That could not be good if he's selling something completely bad. So, you know, I would have the problem. If I would, uh, when I would die, my children could sell the things easily for the very good price. Because for everyone, it's very clear. But today, I would have extremely big problem uh, with everything that is of Lithuanian nature. I would not have problem with the books because international market, maps, no problem. Tomorrow in Poland, anywhere else, you know, I would sell it easily. But with Lithuanian artists, I would have the huge problem. So that, why, why I always think about it, so I have to be careful in the mind in some way for what I do. So you hold the market, the whole market depends on... <laughs> Uh, well, not only on me, any big investors, uh, Willis Kowalowskis, if he would just push everything to the market, or Viktor Osbutko's uh, disaster would happen to the market. Well, hopefully none of them would do it, uh, but, uh, but uh, that would be okay. okay I, I would like to, to ask you, Mr. Ivo Anton, I've read that you have some kind of Estonian art market index and you strongly advocate for lowering barriers in art collecting 
and you try to show as an example that anyone could collect art. Could you elaborate more what, what are your ideas and why do you have such kind of index? And my other question, if anyone could collect art, yeah, uh, well, first about the index. Uh, when I started like being interested in art, I, I, I got acquainted to many gallerists and, uh, and I bought some pieces and so on. And then they said, yeah, Riva, you are a good young man. You're collecting art because art is a good investment, by the way. And uh, maybe I didn't know that much about art at the time, but already knew about investments. So I, I asked, OK, is it an investment? Like, what do you mean? Is it like good returns or maybe stable returns? And then nobody really could answer like, uh, about it. And I understood that actually in Estonia at the time, art market was really like non-transparent. No transparency was there. Because in, in many of other art uh, markets, there is such a thing as art market index, which basically shows how the market is in terms of prices moving, similar to maybe like stock market index or I don't know, real estate index. And then I, I figured that maybe I could do something about it and, and uh, started building a similar index for Estonia. So what it basically means is that I collected all of the public data about the uh, transactions on the market which were mostly done on auctions. And then you can, by econometrical models, calculate an index. And uh, what I discovered there actually was that most of 40% uh, of the works sold on the Estonian art auctions over the period of uh, 98 till 2016 uh, were valued less than 1,000 euros. So approximately like uh, iPhone price. So I figured that actually on auctions usually like more or less good quality art is sold. Not always, but it's somewhat curated. And I saw that actually the barriers are quite high because people tend to think that art is really exclusive, really expensive, and it can be. But uh, still by the statistics, uh, there are a lot of good art available which is quite accessible, uh, I think surprisingly accessible. Because I think around like 20% of the art pieces sold at the Estonian auctions uh, cost less than 500 euros. Okay. Mm. But I think this is only uh, this piece of art which goes through auctions, because I yeah. think a very big amount, uh, uh, much more cost art go without auctions. Totally and agree. Straight. Yeah, totally and, agree. And these, which cost five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousands, mostly sell without auction commission. I, I totally agree on that. And but it's I, the same in Latvian. How how I see it is like, for example, I don't know, maybe any of you like running. So there are different runners. Some go to Olympics. Uh, you know, some do like ultra marathons, some do marathons, half marathons, 10K, some just jog. But they're all like runners. And I see that maybe like art collecting could be very similar. There are like maybe uh, really serious guys, patrons, whatever, whatever. But also like somebody could do it like a hobby. Like, you know, you go jogging uh, evenings. Why not to visit the gallery, buy a print instead of have iPhone, for example. And speaking about Lyceum auctions, essentially there is no contemporary art in uh, Lyceum auctions everything. at all. Yeah. Very rare. I don't know why. Now we have actually a new initiative in Estonia that the galleries are also entering their data into the database. So the index will actually also gather data from galleries mm -hmm. and a lot of contemporary art is going in as well. But don't you have that Lucinian sickness of the galleries that galleries, I mean, galleries selling all their art, they are not showing them. They kind of think is that would be on the wall, nobody would buy it. If you come to the gallery, they would bring you from the dark room saying, okay, this is for you only. <laughs> well, I mean, best piece. <laughs> yeah. Nobody saw it yet. Uh, you are the first. <laughs> there are tendencies to it, yeah, of course. They have the different techniques, I think, of yeah. selling, yes. And Mr. Yanni Zuzans, I would like to address to you now uh, the other angle. Do you feel some 
maybe have every one of you can answer this question. Rivalry among collectors. Do you have such a... With whom? We have just maybe 10 <laughs> in Latvia. No, it is no, for rivalry. we don't have any. You don't have any. No. No, in Lithuania Station it's very nice in the way that Viktor Osbutkus is one of my best friends. He cannot drive, so friend. Vilius Kowalowskis is also a good friend, and you know, somehow, both psychologically and any way, we avoid any competition. Yes, it happens, we find out that we fought for the same painting and auction without knowing each other. But if we know we would try to fight for the same, we try to avoid the fight at all. Maybe it's not fair against auction or whatever, but uh, it's fair towards each other. Yes, but it happens sometimes to try to buy them. But, but psychologically, we're all friends, and it's not an issue at all. I don't think an, an, it's an issue, but I have had a one occasion on an auction where I was bidding on a, on a, on a piece, um, contemporary piece, and uh, I saw that actually um, the other bidder was the, one of the largest Estonian collectors uh, who used to be actually the manager of APA, the, 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 the band, and uh, obviously I understood that you know, our <laughs> means to, to buy the piece are a bit different. But then I realized that he has a, a museum actually, so he will probably display it, you know, somewhere where everybody can can enjoy it. I would just, you know, take it home or the, to the office. So I immediately stopped bidding, and uh, he he bought it. And I actually, I visited his museum just uh, uh, recently and saw that it's well displayed. So we have we have, in, as far as understood, such a small markets that you are you you collectors, you are friends yeah. in Lithuania, in Latvia, and in Estonia. And are you friends, Estonians, collectors? Do you know each other or is it your first time you're meeting? First time? We have uh, met previously. We met few times. So basically we have Lithuanian collectors friends, Latvian friends, Estonian friends, and we do not have such a Baltic collector's market for contemporary art, for example. It's Maybe we'll become friends from today, who knows? Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, we have the different interests, as we found, we each orientated more to the own nationality. But now with contemporary art, if you go broader, that's natural that you have much more interaction with other people. Mm. And Mr. Janis Zuzans, and you, as I read in, in articles online, okay, you are almost a legendary art patronage in Latvia. Yes. I found that written. So and it should be true. Correct me if I'm wrong, yes. <laughs> and how, how did you come up involved in these activities? Like Purvitis Prize, for example, our territory. Do you expect some, some return? Uh, no, we just uh, expect maybe a few returns, and one of them is that Latvian uh, contemporary will be more. Um, recognizing abroad and also uh, that's more uh, when we established Purvitis Prize, it was 10 years ago, now we all this process uh, documented and uh, so how we will uh, you know, make these journals as well as these magazines and uh, uh, now it's easy that uh, we have documented, uh, documented all ten years. These ten years we saw whole Latvian contemporary arts life, yeah? and that is main what we want to have, and we have. Yeah? And uh, how we saw in the last Purvitis Prize um, uh, when we met who will uh, who will win. Uh, Every time it's easier and easier to get to Riga, uh, more and more important judges. And last time come like guys like Tadeo Šropak uh, and uh, another important art uh, celebrities. And, and Latvian art became more and more, I think, popular. And Latvian artists. Uh, when the people come here, they invite uh, Latvian artists, they, as usually, um, 
go and see these studios as well, and then invite uh, some of them to visit and make uh, shows in different countries in the Europe and also in America. And that is that what we do. I think it's very nice. This poor with this price make a great job. So you want that Latvian art should should be somehow stronger, better than, for example, no, Estonian? No, 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 completely no. But we have this prize, and uh, I think if you talk about unified Baltic arts, then I think it's a little bit idealistic view, because uh, collectors, as law, buy a national art, and it's... Uh, I think right because without national collectors we didn't have national art. Yeah. We need these national art collectors, but uh, as what we see now is another uh, way that many of uh, not many but some of Latvian collectors uh, straightly jump to collect international art and then now they sell this Latvian art part. But uh, no, I think. Uh, what we will do together, and maybe now it's time to talk about this, that uh, it will be clever if we will uh, join and make uh, exhibitions together in uh, some places uh, in the old uh, Europe, uh, in like uh, Paris, London, and it's easier to make it together, I think, with uh, Lat Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian, art, contemporary art. Then you will see much more, then you will become much more visible. Okay, do you want to start talking now about that? No, 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 just as a, like idea. Okay. May I ask a question about Latvian market? Because in Latvian business, there is Latvian business and Latvian Russian business. Is the same happening in the art market or not? No. No. Uh, Russians uh, have their own view, and Latvians, uh, we have, we, we use this board, we feel this board. I want to ask to uh, everyone of you, do you feel that your collection, you, that you are responsible for your collection, what you collect, and because your collections will be left for the future generations. It's rather philosophical. I don't know if it's answering, if we can answer that question, that now I collect this, not this, and I am responsible for what I do. Now, because of the future generations, etc., etc. Mr. Ivo, maybe you could give your impressions on that philosophical question, if if we can have some. Uh, I feel I'm responsible only to myself at this point, really. Uh, it is my collection, uh, so uh, I'm not sure whether it will influence the future or not. So I never thought uh, about it in, in this way. <coughs> I, I, I think all of the collections will actually have some meaning in the future. Like, it's just that whether it's very representative or it's like kind of weird uh, or, or something else. But uh, yeah, I, I just want to enjoy it right now by, by, the, by the ideas that I have right now. And I'm, I'm not that much into it, what happens to it in the future. Maybe my kids will sell it, buy beer. Maybe they will continue collecting. All is good. Okay, usually I, I was very idealistic in my life because I was thinking if, if I would collect, I would think about not only myself, but a future generation will look at that or, or maybe... Am I wrong, Mr. Yanni Susans, maybe? Uh, how I saw by Soviet time Latvian art collectors that no one of collections still uh, we have like a uh, wall. Uh, some of the great pieces maybe keep uh, family, 
but usually these collections was split and so uh, for us uh, now I start to think about this problem I became to 60 <laughs> and I think that uh, now we will think about our museum and maybe we will make some uh, institutionally a change that we will some part to give for our museum like a, a, like a separate company and another part will take like our collection which was I don't know about how it will go when we will live from this. You are opening the museum in Riga, as far as I know, yes? Yes, yes, yes. Well, now we start only to talk about projects. I think Yanis might have a very good point in a sense that a good collection is the one that you can't separate. So, I mean, uh, it could be that if you collect, your collection is, is really as a one one piece and uh, nobody could or should want to uh... so to say if you are collecting modern art then you can't collect uh, contemporary art or well you can because uh, it, it's just that if they sort of interact with each other and make a, a thing that can be considered as one well, I think this law didn't work in Baltic states because we have only 100 years experience mm. like uh, countries yeah and this is all like a modern and contemporary. <laughs> we don't have old time masterpieces. No, you do. All of us, we do. No. Well, you definitely have a lot of paintings made in the 18th century and 19th century and earlier. A big part yeah, of my collection is 19th century. But quite a <coughs> few, actually. I, uh, I would say, in my case, it would be at least 200 pieces. Yeah, but I mean, from the general, uh, like... Uh, no, of course, in comparison, yeah. well, in Lithuania we have this problem, you know, as I said in the beginning, many people would say that some of these people spoke Polish, so probably that's not ours. Mm. In my view, it's a huge mistake. Uh, I don't care what language these people spoke, you know, whether that was Yiddish or, or, yeah. or Polish or Lithuanian, that's ours. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, that's my, my permanent fight uh, about the history. <laughs> In Estonia, this is considered like German Baltic time, right? Yeah, and Riga silver is really very nice things. So who cares that it was German masters mainly who did it, so what? Yeah. It's your culture, it's your country. In my view. So, Mr. Landas Valunas, you are collecting from the year 2000? Yes. And I have my last question for you. Do you see some changes in the Lithuanian art market? <coughs> well, the changes always exist. We, we have 22 minutes left. Okay. <laughs> Should I put it on? Market is, well, again, there are different markets because the book market is very different from the paintings market. The photographic market is different again. So. The art market. Uh, there are quite few people that look just at the contemporary uh, market, but there are, yes. There are some uh, well, but for me it's part of my interest only. It's, I'm not full in, 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 in contemporary art. Uh, our market, you know, it's not a secret, and, uh, and our friend Filius Kowalowskis jumped into market uh, seven years ago. He was unhungry, aggressive. He changed market dramatically. One man changed the market dramatically. How he did this? The prices for some pieces doubled, but many more paintings appeared to the market because people who put, kept them on the wall, never thought about bringing them to the auction, suddenly they realized they can become rich if they put this from the wall and bring to the auction. So the market firstly became become more expensive and became more broad because many other things appeared. But it's still very small because and in this room there are many people who are hesitating whether they should jump over the line to become collector, you know. In my definition of the collector, you know, you collector only when you buy when the walls are full. 
But if you would look about the people that are collecting the, the in much bigger, say, way, there are quite few of them. And I would say that it's only a question of time when in Lithuania, unless the thing would go bad, the market would change dramatically. Because if three or five people like Vilus Kavalauskas would come during a period of one or two years, you know, that would change completely. In my so we are small, and this is also good and bad at the same time. And as I said, you don't know what to expect next year. And the new generation is coming, people with new, new views, with different opinions, and, and it's difficult to, 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 to decide where they would go. But of course, among them will be collectors. And again, you know, our first generation of business people are starting to fade away. The kids would have money. What they would do with this money? Would spend for the villas in Spain? Or maybe they will spend for the art? Who knows how they would behave? And that's coming, actually. That question of the next 10 years where this generation shift would occur. And I guess the same in Estonian Latvia as well. Yeah, we will ask what about Latvia? These are the final remarks. Mm, Latvia and market, I think, also by the last 10 years uh, completely changed. It became more international. Mm, so I thought that uh, some uh, collectors jump to collect international art. Uh, but we have also um, some new art uh, collectors. And I think that it's easy to start to collect uh, contemporary art because it's really, uh, for me, it's, I think, underpriced because it's easy to buy for everyone who wants, uh, if you uh, need and if you like it. And if you trust in it and if you don't uh, look at it like an, uh, a piece of invest investment, you buy by your heart, if you really want to take back emotions, uh, then uh, all is clear. And, uh, but uh, we have all three countries one problem, we are very small and uh, this uh, cash flow in our country is a little bit less. Uh, for uh, higher uh, growing this art market as well. And if we will uh, have more people and more, and if you compare with old countries with uh, uh, more, with bigger population, yes, yeah, that uh, our um, art market will be still in progress. Uh, yeah. We are very young, but uh, I think it sounds a good mood. We will go ahead. Well, sooner or later, I think we will be old countries as well. Later. <laughs> <laughs> and the processes in Estonia, what about that? Uh, I think they are quite similar to Latvia, actually. Uh, but you have the new generation, as I see. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether I've influenced that much, but. Uh, um, I think one of the things that has really happened is that the galleries have have become more professional. They go to fairs, they do like uh, professional marketing production for the artists, which uh, catches an eye of the foreign uh, foreign collectors, and I think that's a huge huge benefit for for the market because. As, as already told before, uh, at the moment, the markets are really, really local, meaning that the artists and the collectors, they you know, change ideas and, and transactions between themselves. But once international collectors come in, that's when really I think uh, things can start moving and we can grow bigger than we are, really. Okay. So we need to go internationally to be big. But it's very difficult. Well, because there are very perfect international artists from small countries as well, mm -hmm. but not in tens, not in the hundreds. That's 
with uh, small figures because we don't have money to promote them. And in today, international market, I mean, if you do not invest into artist promotion, because how you would decide if one artist made that bottle and another artist made uh, that boat? So which one of them is famous and worth of 100,000 and which one is just 10,000 or 1,000? Well, the one in which somebody put uh, some money. That's how the market works. Speaking about contemporary art. Of course, you should be good. But there are many good artists. And some of them suddenly become expensive and some not. We have the story about Sauka. Could Sauka become international? Maybe, but maybe, probably it's too late already. Because he was kept here all the time, never really shown abroad uh, except a couple of exhibitions. And probably it's too late. I don't know whether it's possible. He's a very nice artist. So what? Local. Well, uh, for me, it's easy. I don't uh, uh, like so much branded artists, and mostly I have very comfortable for buying my art. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, I think generally art is not an exception when, when comparing to other sectors of life. I mean, imagine. Uh, all of the local companies would produce stuff only for the local people. I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of a closed circle which cannot grow. And I guess that's the same with, with art. Yeah, um, let's come to an end. Because we have exhibition waiting, we have some business uh, waiting for you. <laughs> and uh, uh, as I was listening to you, if, if you remember, I started the, the talk asking why do you collect and now I am thinking why don't I collect. So let's finish here. Thank you for your answers. This is it. Thank you so much.